Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Everyday Trader. This is Greg Jensen from Options Animal. Glad to be with you again today on a Fed day. And it's going to be a good conversation today. Eric, it is good to be with you, my friend. Hey, good to see you, Greg. Our last episode with uh, Lady K, I don't know, I think our fa- one of our fastest growing, probably going to be our number one episode. Uh, people really liked it. Uh, Karen's a fantastic teacher and a it was a fun conversation. Some people really liked it. Check it out. Yeah. So you mentioned the Fed. Um, you expecting big surprises today, Greg? No. I mean, I'm I'm expecting nothing, to be honest. I expect we'll probably see the Fed come out and not raise rates. I don't think they'll cut rates. I'm a lot more confident they're not going to cut rates than that they're not going to raise rates. But I don't think they're going to do anything today. I think the Fed's going to come out and do another hawkish pause. I think they're going to not do anything, but they're going to reiterate that the economy is still very strong, that we're still seeing signs of inflation. Although it's coming down, it has not reached their long-term target. And because we're not seeing any major negative ramifications in the financial world uh, from their tightened their tightened policy that they've got right now, I think they will stay very hawkish. I think they're going to stay tight. And I think they'll forecast that. Uh, The interesting thing will be to see if the, if the market already has that all priced in, you know, the market got really bullish this year uh, with the idea that the fed was going to be done. Um, And then lately in the last three months or so yields on interest rates, yields on bonds have really started to take off to the upside. You know, the 10-year has peaked its nose above 5% a few times. That's put a lot of negative pressure on stock prices. Um, And I think that's, (laughs) and we see, this is our Fed bingo card, right? Um, Yeah. I think, are you you doing this bingo card with me right now? (laughs) How many times I'm saying words in there? No, I... I I don't think they're going to do anything, but I do think they're going to indicate that they're going to stay higher for a while. No, this this is an old. I think this is an old card because you got COVID nineteen. I just uh, did a Google search and and I, well, yeah, that, this one's actually two years ago because I think the the most popular word that we're going to hear is data dependent, and that's what the Fed has been consistent about is that we're going to be data dependent. Uh, I saw a presentation re- recently that was going through. Uh, previous Fed announcements, and and it was just I forgot about this, but on uh, on May fourth, twenty twenty two, we hadn't started the big raising. Uh, so May fourth, Powell says seventy five basis points is not something the committee is actively considering. And in July, guess what we did? <laughs> we raised seventy five basis points. Now, you and I have, you know, these these Fed people are human beings, and we've had the opportunity to talk with them one-on-one and ask these questions. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, they're real people. They're trying to make the best decisions and do the best that they can. And they are data dependent. I mean, that's, that's the one thing that you hear all the time. And in, in May, we hadn't seen inflation go crazy yet. And so we, you know, they, they got data that, you know, really bad May's inflation came in bad June, um, uh, June came in and we hadn't seen July, but we knew where it was heading. So the, the fed cha- pivoted. I mean, right now we've got tight economic conditions. We're the highest we've been in 11 years. And um, I don't know if you heard Drucker Miller yesterday, but there's actually a bullish um, argument for rates being higher. And I know people like Ken Fisher um, have argued that rates, just because rates are higher, doesn't mean that stock market has to go down. Uh, Drucker Miller's comments yesterday were that the good side of the Fed rates being high are um, that it sets a benchmark for for business people to say, listen, we, we need to be able to be able to beat this excellent, you know, five-ish range that we're in, depending on which treasuries you look at. We, we've got to be able to beat that through our investments. So it actually could you know, drive, uh, well, it's going to get rid of the zombie companies, but, but it could actually drive growth. Well, I actually, I agree with that. I think, you know, so we, we've become so accustomed to 0% interest rate policy because that's where we've been for 15 years. And to be honest, the only reason we've been there is because the economy's been broken. And that has been a band-aid 
that the Fed has had to use to keep liquidity alive. And to me, a 5% 10-year yield is fine. I don't think it... I, I, I know a lot of people who have... Opened, their investing career only dates back 10 years are screaming and yelling and saying, this isn't fair. Why are you doing this to our models that we've built? Our models don't work at 5%. Well, okay, but that's really not... this. 0% interest rate is not the sign of a healthy economy. It's a sign of we're saving things. And I, I agree with I, I agree with what Drucken Miller said yesterday. I did see his interview. I was, um, and now, that doesn't mean there won't be some companies. You mentioned zombie-type companies. There are companies that are going to struggle because they haven't adapted to higher interest rates and they don't operate their businesses on free cash flow from the sales of their own operations and they require debt to operate their business. And those are the companies that are going to struggle because they're used to financing their operations at 0%. And now they're having to pay five, six, 7%, sometimes more based on their credit rating. And I, I think that the idea that the next few years are going to be a stock picker's market is actually very true this time. I don't think all Stocks are going to go up right now. Um, I think you have to be very disciplined in now picking companies that have, you know, the fortress type balance sheets that do have good cash flow, good products, good demand for their products. And in fact, we're even seeing some of the the magnificent seven kind of part ways this earnings uh, in a in a little bit. We saw, you know, as an example, we saw Microsoft have fantastic earnings and their stock was up on the back of it. And then you saw Google have really poor earnings and you're, you, it's a diversity. Now, the sentiment of the overall market went along with Google and we've had a sell-off the last couple of weeks and it's we've, we've reached correction territory in the S&P 500, although the last couple of days we're bouncing back above that 200-day moving average, that arbitrary red line there in the sand. But um, yeah, I, I think it... The, the Fed's policy, they don't care about S&P stocks. They don't care about individual companies' earnings. They care about controlling inflation, and they care about employment. And right now, we have a, a an employment market that is still solid. It is still strong. We have an economy that's going forward, and they don't have inflation under control. So I think we're going to – that doesn't mean I think they're going to keep raising, but I, I don't think they're going to cut. And I think yeah. we're getting I mean, a long time. Elevated is still uh, restrictive. Keeping the rates high is still restrictive. Yeah. Uh, I'm in the camp that we're going to see one more rate hike. I know that people are looking at the um, the Fed Watch tool and they're showing the probability of the rate cut. We were talking ahead of time. I mean, that's, there's, uh, I only look at the Fed Watch rate, uh, the Fed Watch tool, which I'll pull up now just be, to talk about it, uh, the Fed Watch on CME. I only look at it to see the changes. So if, if news happened today, something happened today, how does that affect the probability? And this is the one that I'm going to be looking at. So the current uh, rate is 25, uh, I'm sorry, 525 to 550. That's where we're at. And the probability yesterday of us being there was 69. I don't know that you take 69 to the bank, but 74, you say, well, there's a 5% increase that we hold. So I'd say that what ha the news today, it's more likely we don't raise rates. So tomorrow I'll be looking at the response to the Fed meeting today, which is happening in a few hours, happened with the market open. We'll probably see some moves in the market, but I will come here for sure tomorrow to say, so everybody, you just Google search the CME Fed Watch tool and you'll find this. And I'll be looking at how these numbers changed. As far as looking at these probabilities out in the future, it's... We've been looking at this thing for a decade, you know, 10 years. We look at this thing. It's never right. Um, and if anything, I think the market is overly optimistic that it's showing that in here it's forecasting rate cuts. That's not totally what this says. Um, you got to take this with a grain of salt. And I, the value, I think, is was the news today significant and impacting uh, the Fed? Does the market think the news today was significant and impacting the Fed's decision to raise or hold rates or cut rates? And that's what this tool is useful for. So be careful with it. So I wanted to point out one other thing, and there was a, a report issued today. So this, the TBAC, which is, um, it's a 
the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee. These are people outside of the government that uh, economists and other experts, financial experts, who provide um, analysis, independent opinion to the Federal Reserve. And um, it's, you know, you can read it, it's a lot of garbly gook here. And I use chat GPT to tell me what it says because I'm all about efficiency. So uh, chat GPT says the key and economic indicators from, this is, this is a summary of this report. So according to chat GPT, 10 year treasuries are at their highest GDP growth is strong, unemployment is strong. So came out saying that, hey, economy's good. Um, market reactions and expectations. Investors are optimistic about near-term growth and less worried about a recession. Um, there's a growing belief that the neutral interest rate is now higher affecting long-term yields. Two-year treasuries have been stable, suggesting short-term monetary, monetary policy, policy isn't the main driver of changes. And so there's some recommendations that they have here, but um, this is a very positive, a very bullish statement. There's people who are out there bringing the alarms that, you know, we've got a debt crisis and I, you know, we all agree that we have a debt problem, uh, but uh, I'm not in the camp that, um, that, you know, we're going to see a big crash anytime soon. I think we're going to, we, we definitely will hit a wall if we keep going. But at this point, I, it's, it's really the ability to service debt and debt to GDP, debt payments to GDP, those measures, we're still not at high levels. And this report sort of confirms um, that, that the concerns that's happening, what's happening in the treasury market actually is probably could be a positive thing um, because the economy is definitely strong. And in light of that, um, I, I'm in the camp that we're not going to see a rate hike today or no announcement of a rate hike. But I expect, like you said, a hawkish pause with um, a, we're definitely leaning towards the Fed needing to press on the brakes a little bit more. So I I think we'll see another one in December. I would, the, the odds are not showing that right now. We're showing, you know, this uh, 25% probability of us raising rates. Um, I, I would think that it's, I would put money that that's, I would take that bet that we're going to raise rates in December. All, yeah, something else happens. I think I agree with you on that one. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, like you said, unless something else happens, unless we have something break, but I don't see signs of anything breaking. I mean, as you go through so far, I know we're not, we're kind of in the middle of earnings season right now. We've had a lot of earnings so far with S and P 500 companies, and some of them are showing some signs of struggle, uh, but most of them aren't. I think overall the S and P is doing okay. The consumer is resilient. Um, they still have capital. I know a lot of people said, "Well, they've blown through all their COVID money." Well, yes and no. There's still a lot of liquidity in the system. Uh, it depends on where you're at. I know different. Um, classes of people as far as their socioeconomic ladder um, may be struggling more than others. And that, that I think, is more due to um, inflation um, rather than, uh, than necessarily the, the, the levels of interest, but which is one of the things the Fed's trying to do is slow this inflation down. Um, but, but I think for the most part, earnings are still pretty good. Now, I'm interested to hear, and I know one of the things that you and I talked about beforehand, and I don't know if you're ready to segue there right now, but I am really interested to see what and how our favorite company in the world, that you and I are both fanboys of their product, and probably their stock for that matter. I'm more of a fanboy of their product than I am their stock right now, but it's going to be really interesting to see what path Apple follows um, as they are set to announce earnings tomorrow, um, before, uh, or af after the market close. Yeah. So Apple has earnings tomorrow, Thursday, November 3rd, after the close. And, um, you know, here's a chart of Apple. We've kind of been in this, this, I mean, somebody flipped the switch here, August 1st. It was, it's pretty obvious that something changed. Um, and, and we're in a, a new trading regime. One could argue that we're in this channel here bouncing sideways uh, or trending downward in this downward trend. If you're a technician, maybe you could probably help with that. But we've had a bounce here in the past week that looks pretty significant. Um, we're looks like we're getting close to the, to the simple moving averages. This is the 50 day moving average or the 200 day moving average is the red line. 
and um, we're looking to get uh, above that 200 day. It's uh, we broke below it, and there's the green line is the 50, and the uh, blue line is the I'm sorry, the blue line is the 50. The whatever, yeah, there's there's the index there. So technicals, I don't want to get wrapped around the axle on technicals. I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, first of all, Apple had a big event this week, which is kind of weird uh, for them to do, you know, two or three days before an earnings announcement that they do a product release. And that was the scary fast uh, announcement. Did you have any comments on that, Greg? Did you pay attention to the, did you watch the product announcement? I'm sure you know. I didn't even, I didn't even watch it. What did I miss? Uh, well, they just announced the M3 chips. There's an M3 plus. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah, I, did. I know you know about it. It's just, but the, that, that goes to the point that I wanted to make about Apple. It was a pretty much a non-event. Yeah. Uh, I was live streaming in a, in a, um, in a, what do you call it? The, um, discord forum. I was actually in Mark Gurman's power on, uh, discord forum and people were chatting live and that's wait, that's it. That we did an we we did it we did a special announcement made a big deal about this weird time they've never done an announcement at night at night and I mean the 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 chips are very impressive they're super fast they're much more efficient if you, anybody hasn't tried a new M1 I know you got a new M1 or M2 or whatever you got the new Apple yeah system. the battery life is phenomenal right oh it's unbelievable in fact I'm using my computer right now. Um, that I just looked at the battery as we're recording this, and I'm at 13%. And I'm realizing, I don't even know where my charger is. <laughs> been that long since I charged my computer. It's probably been a week since yeah. I charged my computer. And I use it every day. Um, yeah, and the, it's a, the, new, the new chip is amazing. Yeah. The, this, it is a huge uh, impact or improvement. And uh, I think the new top-end Mac is something like $7,100. Freaking amazing. Yeah. Um, you could almost, you could probably buy a car for that. But so we got earnings coming up and um, I, we started our show a little bit late today because I got a, I got pretty jazzed on using some new features that are in chat GPT. Uh, so there's some advanced data analysis features that are there. And what I did was I uploaded the earnings dates and uh, Apple historical pricing and had a conversation with, chat GPT and some of the advanced features and asked it to do some data analysis for me. And the question that I had was, you know, what is the the typical change following earnings one day, one week, a month, and three months later? And, and the changes are 1% the day after, 1.1 a week after. And this actually is just the change. So it's not necessarily positive or negative. A little deeper down, it does tell me that it's, uh, it is a 1.4% increase or 1.12% a week later, and a month later, 3.75%, 7.3%, three months after earnings, which is really interesting because that sits right on top of the next earnings event. There's some other data, and the question that I had is, what percentage of the time is the move positive? And it does lead a little bit higher. I had read previously somebody else's analysis that 62 was the number that sat in my head, but based on this analysis that I just did right before the show here, um, Apple is positive 56% of the time. Uh, and a week later, it's higher 58% of the time. A month, 57. And uh, three months later, 63% of the time, it's higher. So we, t we tend to get some of these. And if you want to look at the pie graphs, so here's, a, here's some pie graphs that um, show, it's a little bit hard to see there, but the red slices. So it's definitely higher more often than not. And I could have spent some more time um, having fun with this. It was a fun conversation. It took me about oh, 10 or 15 minutes to do this. Um, and I normally do that work myself. And and I'm telling you, it would have taken me hours to do that. It was pretty amazing that I was able to upload those. X I uploaded a CVS file and, I, and it noticed that the dates formats were wrong. So this isn't a chat GPT discussion, but, but dude, Chat GPT is huge. And tying this back into Apple, what are we looking for in Apple? And there's, you know, it's all gonna, it's all gonna be about the Apple, the iPhone 15. Um, and we're gonna wanna hear how that's going. So I think there's three key things that I'm looking for in the Apple. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm trading it. Then I have a trade on. I'll share what the trade is here in a bit. But 
three things that I'm going to be paying attention to are, first of all, there's the normal stuff, the you know revenue and margin, all that sort of stuff. But iPhone 15 comments, how are we doing? Because we're getting mixed signals. Is demand um, higher or lower than we expect? And so there'll be questions mostly from the analyst about what's going on with the 15 demand. China, what's happening yeah. in China? We haven't seen the boom in China like we expect. And then going back to this chat GPD thing, Apple and AI. I mean, the perfect use, I mean, for you and me as Apple fanboy product fans, the perfect use is Siri, you know? And if I could do this with Siri, I just, you know, I, I so I want to hear what Apple has to say about AI. And I Apple has a lot of credibility. I don't think uh, Tim Cook's going to, um, you know, try to pump the stock and, and promise something. So I'm, I'm, I don't know which way it's going to go, uh, what they're going to say. They can easily deport, di uh, disappoint the market. Um, but I'd like to get your thoughts on what you're paying attention to over earnings. And um, and then let's talk about some trades. So, yeah, um, I'm going to have to agree. The To me, the biggest question marks, you just, you just hit them. iPhone 15, China, and AI. I think there's a long-term play that I really like in Apple that I do want to hear some commentary on. And that's really how they're going to use the watch for healthcare. I know there's a lot of, I was reading an article in Bloomberg last week about some of the things that they're going to roll out, the Apple's rolling out with the watch being, uh, you know, be able to sense people's blood pressure, detect sleep apnea, things like that, and turning the, you know, turning the AirPods into hearing aids, those types of things. There's a lot of products that they have, they're wearable products that I that have a healthcare future. And so I do, I am optimistic about that. But in the short term, I think the biggest question is China. Um, China, Leland Miller from the China Beige Book was on Bloomberg yesterday. And he was talking about how investing in China has changed. You know, five years, even from five years ago, but definitely from 10 years ago, is portfolio managers can't invest in China like they used to be able to. And I think the same is true even of mega caps like Apple. I think it's becoming a harder market because of trade sanctions, because of political tensions. It's becoming harder and harder for Apple to, to have the level of profitability and growth in China like they've had in the past. And I think the only way Apple is going to change the stigma away from China is if they can show growth in places like India and Indonesia and Africa that still are growing, developing economies and have a future in front of them because I think they're going to lose ground in China. I don't think China is going to be a, a good piece of data. I hope I'm wrong because I want to be bullish right now. I, I think, you know, the move I feel like is most likely going to be bullish as long as we don't get negative news out of China. Um, the AI story, I agree. If if they can start to say things, because you know they're working on stuff. Apple's just also notoriously quiet about what they're working on, and they don't like to just leak it out before it's done. I mean, they kind of did that with Siri, to be honest, the first time. And when Siri first came out, she was kind of a flop. Um, it's gotten better, but it's still not fixed. It still is incomparable. Uh, although I've become much more confident in having conversations with Siri in the last year than I have with Alexa. Alexa is horrible right now. Um, really? Amazon's product. Yeah. I, it's, I mean, I still have it. I still use it. Um, but I've actually gotten more and more comfortable with Siri. Sorry, I know we're having a really odd conversation about <laughs> conversations we're having with our <laughs> with our robots that sit in our house, right? It's uh, amazing. But I think... I mean, we're not too far away from, um, I mean, we get integration with AI and Ray-Ban has these new glasses. I mean, right now, I mean, there's this big hood thing you're going to put on your head, the vision. I mean, that's, maybe we get some updates from Apple on that vision. I, you know, I'm thinking two, three generations where it, it's not more complicated than this, maybe a little bigger than this. And it's just natural. You, you're talking and it's, hey, do you want my thoughts on that? Really? But this chat GPT thing, by the way, that what I just did, I don't, it, it probably, oh, 
not something that's very basic. It took me some head scratching to figure out how to do it, but I won't have to work too hard next time. And I'm concerned because I want to use a lot less mental power going forward, which is a good thing, but um, I, it's uh, it's going to take a lot of effort off of me in terms of thinking. I wonder if there's going to be a dumbing down of America. But on, uh, on your comments about the Apple products, I am very excited about the <clears throat> the health stuff. I mean, there's talks about a glucose uh, monitor in the watch coming out and um, you know, Apple's pretty interesting. I don't know if you, you know this oxygen meter that's in there. Um, did you read that predatory story about them? So Apple met with a, com a company that had a watch that does oxygen sensors. Apple met with them, then hired a bunch of their people and then introduced the watch with so there's, there was uh, some lawsuit here recently. It says kind of the kiss of death if Apple wants to come talk to you about your technology. <laughs> I, uh, but I don't think Apple's going to talk too much about new products. That's not what they, they usually don't talk about products, new products, future products. Um, but there is another product, another area that I think is worth looking at. And that's also in the services area is uh, I forgot, I forgot to mention that they, you know, they're increasing the cost of Apple TV. I saw that. Yeah. So how I'm, I'm wondering how their subscription services business, I get my credit card gets hits with like four or five Apple subscriptions a month. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's my watch warranty. Oh, that's my phone warranty. That's my wife's warranty. Oh, that's my MacBook warranty. Oh, that's Apple TV. Oh, that's my Apple family plan. And they hit me in all these small numbers. If they roll them up, I'd probably but I'm wondering how that, I'd like to get some feedback on how that subscription's growing because it is very high margin business for them. That's another key area. Maybe we'll hear something about. I, I'm, like I said, I'm optimistic. I, I, the fact that they've, they were at 196, 190, I actually don't think they actually broke 200. I want to say they hit like 199 intraday, uh, about three months ago. They're, they're down, they hit 165, 166 last week. They're back up above 170. Like you said, back up above that technical level of 200 day moving average. Um, but they're still a full 15% off their highs. Um, if we were at 52 week highs right now, I'd be a little more pessimistic going into this earnings event as to how the stock was going to react. But the fact that we've pulled back already and we've seen good results from the likes of Microsoft and how Microsoft reacted to their earnings. I think there's a chance Apple pops. Um, now, will they pop 20%? No, they're too big. We're not going to see that type of growth. Um, but could they have a 2 or 3% move this week? I think that's a possibility by the end of the week. And three months from now, when we get to the end of the year, following those data numbers that... Uh, that uh, chat GPT put together for you? Could we be 7% higher by the end of the year? Yeah, I think if Apple has solid earnings and the market does its traditional November through January rally that it typically has, yeah, I think there's a chance that Apple could be back to all-time highs by the end of the year. Um, you know, barring some major, like we were talking about before, some major move from the Fed or a geo, major geopolitical change uh, that causes the whole market to get up bearish. But I think that's a lot of that's priced in right now with the pullback we've already had. So um, it's going to be very, uh, it's going to be a very volatile week. I'm going to be trading it too. I currently do not have a position, but I'm going to enter one today, actually, as, after we get done with this. What are you going to trade? Um, probably a form of an exploding bull put. Okay. So explain that a little bit. What's what's an exploding bull put? So an exploding bull put to credit spread, um, there's a lot of different ways to play it, um, and it's going to depend on pricing. I haven't really done all the analysis. I'm actually going to do that over on the Trader Oasis side right now and share that trade with the Trader oh, Oasis nice. community. Nice. So I, I don't want to lead it. I don't want to throw it the exact details of you know trade. that'll be the third apple trade in less than a week <laughs> awesome but that's okay i'm yeah. apple, right we love apple so so anyhow the it's basically using a credit spread which is a bull put and then i'm going to use the credit from that credit spread to trade a potential explosion one way or the other i could lean bullish i could lean bearish i could lean neutral 
You know, so again, using a credit spread to create the purchase of a strangle is an example of an exploding type of trade. Or using a credit spread, the bull put, to maybe buy a long call. Mm-hmm. Then That's well, my favorite approach. I do that a lot uh, because yeah. one of the things people don't like about credit spreads, they're high probability. They usually work. Um, but the problem is, or not a problem, uh, you know, if the stock, if you're right and the stock goes up a lot, you don't make a lot of money. And yeah. so you kind of feel like, oh, you feel deflated. And um, yeah, and, and I'll be honest with you. So I, I'm, I'm going to trade similar. I'm not similar. Uh, right now, I've got two trades going on. Um, and I'll, I'll be frank, the trade that I did on Monday, right before the close, right before the announcement, I did a very bearish trade on Apple and closed it the first half hour. That trade did very well. Because typically, when Apple has a product announcement, um, the stock goes down. On the contrary, like I showed that data earlier, about 56% of the time, Apple is higher. And I do, like you, I think there's a potential for an explosion to the upside, especially if if the numbers are better. And we've seen some, recently, we've seen some really big moves, bigger than expected. And so in terms of expectations, my expectation is that Apple, by the end of the week, will either touch 178.50 or 165.50. So we're going to be somewhere up around here, or we're going to be down here. So I've structured an iron condor that makes money if it stays within that range. But the iron condor was cheap enough that I could actually buy two calls on the long side. So the trade, if it's stagnant, will do well. If it's very bullish, it it will explode to the upside. Now, this trade has all of the moving parts in it. It's about as complicated of a trade as you can get. Another way to think of this trade is for those of you that might be familiar with uh, with call ratio backspread. So a call ratio backspread, you have two long positions and one short position. It's like a bear call with an extra long call. That trade will do well in a stagnant trend or a very bullish trend. But there's kind of this gap, This I call it the chasm of death. And I think of Indiana Jones jumping over the pit of vipers. If too much time goes by and volatility crushes, that trade gets destroyed. So I'm going to have to watch carefully for that. If the stock and that the the pit of vipers on that trade is where the the two long calls are. So that's one trade I have. The other is I've got a long standing stock position. I roll in and out of Apple. I there's no stock that I wouldn't sell. You know I've said this before. I I'll sell anything for the right price. Um, so I've been in and out of Apple shares. When I hit my goals on my profit, I sell the stock. And right now I do have a stock position and I need to protect that position. So what I'm going to do on that trade is um, what we call, what Options Animal teaches as a vanilla collar trade. And I'll have a, um, a longer term short call and a short term long put that's at the money. And what that trade looks like, you mentioned a straddle earlier. That trade looks very much like a straddle. Um, and the stock will explode in either direction. If it moves in either direction, that trade will make money. And it's a theta negative trade. So if the stock doesn't move, it loses a little bit of money. So the real key in managing that trade is managing it after the earnings event. But it's a nice trade to have. I had the same thing on Tesla and actually made money when Tesla had its big gap down. So I had the same structure trade. So it's not uncommon for option traders to have multiple strategies going on in the same equity. Uh, you got to know how to manage them so they don't get doesn't get too confusing. But but that's those are the two trades that I got going on. So we talked about some pretty interesting stuff. Um, you're looking at. So did you say you, you can? You're kind of all over. What 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 do you think you're you're looking? Oh, at? I think I'm going to go. The, I think I'm going to go bullish. I think I'm still going to lean bullish. So I didn't I'm affect you, did I? No 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 no. That's a, that's where I was leaning before, and it has to do with their, where they're at in their price. You know, they were if they were at 190, I'd be leaning bearish. But they're at 170. They've already had a pretty good sized pullback in the last three months, and I think there's more upside potential than there is downside potential right now with this earnings report. And what would you do if it went down, Greg? I'll take possession of the shares because this is a company I love owning. This is one of those fundamental stocks that I was going off about before. Of they don't have to use debt to finance their operations. They have free cash flow. They can finance their business with that free cash flow, and um, long term, this is definitely a company I want to. I wouldn't mind owning over the next two to three years if I have to. So if I'm wrong, I will let the bull put get assigned, 
I'll buy the sheet. So I'll get, I'll basically end up buying the shares and then I'll turn it into a covered call and a collar trade if needed. Yeah. And there's a lot of moving parts that's there. Greg and I speak the same language. So I know that there's a few steps that he's skipping in there. So um, you're going to need to be concerned about getting assigned and having that long put expire. And there's steps that you'd manage in between. And that's not really what we're here to talk about. But I'm joining one of our free webinars over at Options Animal. We'll teach you how to do it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Like thousands of other people. Anyways, I hope this is helpful. Let's end this so that we can get this out soon. And hopefully you guys, can, uh, the, our community can benefit from it. Awesome. Good to talk to you, Eric. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you all at the next one. You too. We'll talk to you later.